you who were at A7 in 2014, I sort of professed my girl crush on uh, Helen Ringlinger at that point. <laughs> Sorry, DJ, but it's true. So, I love you. I love you. I love you. I feel like the, the love fest is continuing right now <laughs> because I'm, I'm feeling that way by yeah, Anne Kramer as well. Uh, I've used Anne Kramer's name and the name of her vineyard a lot, even though I never knew her because I hear it a lot and we talk about it a lot and it's a nice um, sort of connection between, we already had Angela Osborne's presentation yesterday and then we had uh, Helen last year at the River Line, so it seems very fitting. And I feel so fortunate that she's here today and we can actually really get to know her. So she's, uh, as you'll find out, she's going to tell you about herself and her vineyard. And I got to talk to her a little bit yesterday. But she's uh, definitely making a name for Omnor County and the foothills in general, um, doing things that I think have never been done before there for the Appalachian. And um, I, as a, coming from the winemaking side and as a winemaker, after speaking with her, I just kept thinking, I'm, I'm, I just feel like all the winemakers that get to buy fruit from you are so lucky. So I'm going to pass it over to her. But we're so excited to have you here again. Well, well, thank you. And first off, I want to say I am very lucky to have the lineup of winemakers that we do have buying and shake fruit. fruit. So we'll get to taste some of the Rome varieties. We still have two other um, Rome winemakers that aren't here. Um, as well as Tempranillo, Zinfandel, and Morbera winemaker. So it's it's a really fun piece of property, and I look forward to telling you all about it. So right now, I'm just going to give you a quick history of how I got there. So growing up in an orange growing family, my dad was a third generation orange grower from a family that's been the Yorga family's been in California since 1769. Um, and so always farmers, ranchers. Um, I think there was even a winemaker way back. <laughs> but um, I, of the eight siblings in my generation, I was that the joke is is that you know probably dropped me at some point because I was the only one who really enjoyed working in the orange groves. Went to Davis, studied pomology, which would be fruit trees, and um, after working a couple of years, went back and I just realized I really wanted to farm. Went back and did the orange groves and realized that with the price of water, oranges in Southern California weren't going to last much longer. So I went back to Davis and started dating a guy out in Grand County and realized, I better learn about these little plants. So I took a couple of big classes, which led to an internship at Sterling, which led to a job with a vineyard management company in Napa, Sonoma, which led to a vineyard manager job with Swanson when they first got started in Oakville in the mid-80s, um, and then Domain Chandon in the early 90s. And then started consulting in 97 and um, in Sonoma, Napa, up and down California pretty much, and down in Chile. And the whole time, I kept looking for this mystical piece of property that I could afford. And I got to be the best pencil pusher and could talk myself out of anything. I just didn't have enough funds and the wherewithal to just jump in, be first. And so in 2001, my dad called and said, I'm selling a piece of property that if we, you can find something I could trade for, do a 1031 exchange, which means you defer capital gains, that you'd want to farm. So we're talking inexpensive and really good quality. So please, Dad, please me, and um, talk to my other siblings. Thank goodness I have a lot of them. They all were willing to invest in the vineyard, so we did it. And the good thing about a 1031 exchange is you have 45 days to identify a piece of property. So instead of 20 years, I took that 20 years of information and just went for it. And quickly decided that foothills would be my best option for the quality I wanted and underappreciated property. Um, and we looked, I looked up every realtor in the three hour range because I was figuring this is a family project, so it's not going to be mine. I'm going to still be in Napa, still be consulting, but I'd be doing this on the side. So I had, I gave myself a three hour range from, from Napa and the foothills, and so started above Grass Valley, went down to about Mariposa. And there was 200 pieces of property for sale that fit our budget and what I was looking for. And 40 were worth looking at. So in four days, we checked them out. By the third day, I was so disappointed. I thought, this is not going to work. And then we walked upon Shake Ridge. So it was just a 
Um, that'll give you an idea of where in the foothills it is. And then um, it's, it was a blank slate. It had been already cleared in the late 1800s by Italian immigrants. It, rolling hills, just beautiful looking soils by, by the trees, the oak trees that were there, you knew it was a nice deep soil. It had been, um, so this will give you an idea, no neighbors, there was nobody growing um, grapes in the area. It was mostly just oak, pine, um, cattle grab. And um, so, one more. So, but the elevation was what I was looking for. I was, I was looking somewhere between 1,500 and 2,500. And in the foothills, the elevation is not as important as cold air drainage coming down from the Sierras. Um, there were slopes facing every direction, so I thought okay, I'll have a lot of things, to, little microclimates to play with. Um, fairly steep, 10 to 28% is what we actually planted. Um, the soils in that area are the Josephine and, and Mariposa series. But we dug, in the original 34 acres, we dug 22 soil pits, six feet deep. And in general, just beautiful, deep, well-drained, rocky soils, really gorgeous red. Um, but you go from section to section, from hill to hill, the hard rock that was there, there could be black shale, white quartz, the rose quartz that um, Angela mentioned yesterday. There was this um, soapstone. I mean, it was just crazy. It was. Um, just really interesting, and one of my mindmakers terms it as geological chaos. And then that's a map of Amador County, and the right where it turns from the stripes to the solid, that's about where we're at in Amador. And uh, a geologist says it was like the old tectonic plate, and then when California was formed 140 million years ago, and all these islands came smashing in, that was the start of it. And then you throw on some volcanic activity, some uplifts, it's, it's every single pit we dug looked different. <laughs> so um, we've got all these different rocks, these red rocks, black shell, white quartz, and some really nice clay loam holding it all together. The climate is, um, some years we really truly have four seasons. We normally get a dusting, or the vineyard is from 1650 to, um, 1810 foot elevation. We normally get a dusting of snow. Some years it sticks around for a good week. I pruned once in late March in eight inches of snow. That's a little worrisome, <laughs> but it happens. Um, the, um, the winters can get really cold and we have some freeze injuries some years. I try really hard to make sure the vines are a good carbohydrate storage and, and they're healthy, they get through it. Um, spring times, we, we definitely get spring, late spring frost, um, our normal, normal bud break. We've only been farming, but this is gonna be our 11th vintage, so I feel like that's way too soon to even know what normal is, but um, these last two years have been way early compared to previous normal bud break is more April to mid-April, depending on the variety. Um, summer times are, are warm, and we're gonna talk about that. It's this whole thing about how nice it cools off. Early spring frosts or fall frosts are also an issue. We have a nice long season. So um, the, the trick is, and, and as I said, where you, you know, when you're looking for places, looking for um, a spot that had on a ridge, because in, oh, it takes me about 50 minutes from the ranch, I'm up at 8,000 foot elevation going up Shake Ridge Road. And you can feel that as soon as the valley starts cooling off, <laughs> At, um, um, in the afternoon, you can just start feeling this breeze come down out of the mountains. And we have really huge diurnal. This was a very warm week. So you see a couple of days went over 100. But the lower parts of the vineyard, which is most of it, uh, the, the dark line is a hilltop, and you still have a good 35 degree difference. Um, but typically, it's almost a 50 degree from night to day. Um, it helps retain acidity. <laughs> so in planting the vineyard, it became, okay, what to put where? Not having the, you know, can't look over the fence and see what the neighbors are doing. And the area is meant for, for zen. Um, so we definitely planted some zen. Barbera was, tasted some good barberas. That seemed worthwhile. Got talked into Tempranillo, very a 
thought I was, dropped into it. Um, and then the Rome varieties, I was just, I've always been kind of that cool climate Syrah person, and um, Annie Fabia from Fabia Wines asked me, would you please plant, we want some warm season Syrah. So I said, okay, are you sure? And then I had planned one more of a Southern Rome style for the Grenache and Vedra. So this will give you an idea. Syrah got the coolest seats in the house. So they got the north and northeast facing slopes. Um, and then meanwhile, Mavedra, I put on as steep of a slope as I could with the southwest orientation. So it would get um, not only long, as long as daylight possible, but being on a slope like that, one vine did not shape the next. Um, Grenache got a nice west facing slope. That I wasn't sure it could go either, either way. Um, and the Viognier, I just figured there is no way. I just put in a half an acre of Viognier thinking somebody might want to co ferment their Syrah with the Viognier. So it got a very cold spot and has gotten frosted several times because of that. Petite Syrah, not really a rum varietal, but we're going to taste it anyway because <laughs> it's so interesting. Close enough, right? Um, it got, being such low vigor and the latest to bud break, it got the low, kind of richer soil blocks in the middle. Then in 2009, we were able to plant some more. So I kind of fine-tuned things. Um, we definitely wanted more Mavedra, more Grenache to go with the Syrah that we had. And by that time, and when we taste the Viognia, we'll talk about that. But I was convinced that, yeah, maybe we can do white wine at Figure. Um, the rootstock choices, you know, after living through AXR in the early, or the late 80s, early 90s, and replanting, I was just going to make sure I used as many options as I could. Um, our soil is very magnes high in magnesium, so I kind of aired towards the 10114 over the 3309, same thing with 110R over um, 1103 um, Paulson, because those two exclude magnesium somewhat compared to their counterpart. But in the, in the better soils that had more um, vigor potential, or varieties like Syrah that I was worried about vigor potential, I used the, the moderate vigor rootstocks, whereas in the rockier soils and the weaker ones, I went for the, the big boys. Um, happen to love, right now, if, you, if I just said I could only have one of each, I'd say 420A, and, and yes, it shows potassium deficiency in the springs, and yet it, it's a low vigor, but boy, that, that block, those, I have three blocks now, they can handle drought. They're really good. You just don't push them. They're really good. St. George, love St. George. Bring on the shatter. As far as, you know, the, the, the varieties we have, a little shatter is a good thing. <laughs> and it seems tough, and it's not super big at all. Um, road direction, so, so once planting the vineyard, once I decided what we wanted, the whole attitude was, okay, avoid sugar. I wanted to avoid sugar, because right? I figured we're going to have plenty, we're going to have a lot of alcohol here. So road directions where there's a great study that was done in the 80s um, by an Italian, and it was all these different road directions. So true north-south is 20% more photosynthetic activity than east-west. So I wanted to stick with that east-west, makes sense, it keeps the sun overhead. However, if it's true east-west, that south side's gonna get baked to come late August, September, as the sun starts falling into the southern sky. So ideally, I was looking for like a 20% off of northeast, southwest. And um, that's what we tried for, but as you can see from the picture, the slope still dig, um, um, dictated what we were gonna be able to do. So where we did get the slopes we wanted, in general, the general um, trellis system was a relaxed BSP, so I used wider cross arms hoping for this nice wide canopy, um, especially at the top, so I'd have shoots fall over instead of staying upright, act like a little sun parasol. Um, we alternated the spurs as we developed the vine to, uh, most of the varieties we planted are big clusters, so trying to keep the fruit separate as much as we have and have this nice wide canopy. And then on the blocks that the slope I just wasn't able to, and like this is a, a block of Zen that needed to go north-south, we did an overhang on the west side. So the west side gets a little bit more foliage. And then just not leaving it, it actually just gets that much more protection. And then um, on the 
where I could. I, half of the Zen, the very first planting, I did with the head train, the goble. And now, and I kept track of costs, production for the first 12 years. If I planted now, I would plant anything I thought could be head trained, I would plant head trained. I, I love it. The 2009 planting right now, I have an acre of Grenache and an acre of Tempranillo. But right now they're bad teenagers. It's, it's really hard to get them opened up into a true gold light, but it's going to be worth it. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the trellising and the um, canopy management as we go through the different products. I'm just trying to give you an overview. Our vineyard management, um, we prune as late as possible. We pre-prune and then come in as each variety starts leafing, prune again. And that's my frost protection. We're way too hilly. The only thing, you know, there's, we don't have enough water for, for sprinklers and we don't have the terrain that a wind machine would work on. So it's just avoiding frost. Um, and then all of the pruning is for balance. Based on the previous year's growth, the guys adjust the pruning as they get you know, to weaker areas, they cut back, and the more vigorous vines, they leave a little bit more fruit. Um, we won't irrigate until after the vines have slowed to almost stop their growth, and we've done all of our shoot thinning and crop thinning. Maybe not all of our crop thinning, because we do a lot of crop thinning, but the big, the big pass. And, um, and so to me, irrigation is just to keep the parts of the vineyard that need it from raising and but not to push growth that out at all. I will irrigate in these last four years. There's been one, two winters that I finally just said, okay, the ground is so dry for the winter that we'll do one irrigation to kind of make up for the fact that there hasn't been rain. Um, but as soon as I do that, it does rain. So for the rest of California, I'm doing it for you, okay? <laughs> Because as soon as I do it, it will rain. Um, our soil nutrition program is, um, the, or the soils have very low cation exchange capacity. So I just, I've never been, I learned in the past, past jobs I've had that the synthetic fertilizers tend to just send soils one way or the other. And when you have this low of cation exchange, you just can't do it. So our whole nutrition program, and the soils are really low fertility, which as far as nitrogen is a good thing, but low phosphorus, low potassium, low boron, low zinc. So we do it with compost and soil amendments in the fall. And then maybe one compost tea addition during the summer if I think a lot needs it. Um, canopy management tends to be ideally filtered light. We'll talk about the differences for the different varieties. Um, but again, this wide canopy, I'm not, um, it doesn't have to be upright. We're really trying to keep direct light off of pretty much everything. And then crop management is, we've got these deep, really big soils. And so I'm constantly fighting um, vigor early and then trying to get the vine smaller. So often I'll use leaf crop on longer or do multiple passes in order to keep the end product with small berries and a, and a amount of crop that doesn't need irrigation to support it and you know so it's like starting off with a big vine and then trying to make it last through the summer as a small vine. And um, try to be as sustainable as possible. Um, it's an area with very low mildew pressure so we can get by with just sulfur sprays and then the, the Sonata Serenade the bacterial products. Um, owl boxes are finally, I finally have enough that they're taking care of my gopher population, which is huge. Foxes, bobcats, they help too. Coyotes, they're really actually very good. Um, mites are a big issue in the foothills, but um, we've been able to use beneficial thrips. Um, we started off with beneficial mites, that the thrips work much better at our temperatures. And we've got that kind of under control. Every single row has its own net. I, I tend to almost lose my full-time employee every year when we're done with bird netting because it's such a pain about what goes there. Um, a lot, it's very steep, so we did a whole lot of work early on, and then we keep up our cover crops for erosion control. And my biggest bugaboo is weeds because I hate seeing people out there shoveling and weeding on really hot days. And so it's so easy to just do that one strip of Roundup, but it's as you all know, it's between resistance, it just isn't working. And um, I've got a good trial going right now to do a smother crop and see if I can use that to keep our weed pressure down. I, I really have good hands.
handling weeds. So my father, this orange grower, he comes up, he hates weeds. I have to tell you, I, I spent all, the years I worked for him was completely clean. And I have a really high tolerance. I call them wildflowers, right? <laughs> so, so that's our general farming. I think, oh, and then harvest. Um, we do harvest at night. Most of our fruit goes four to five hours away. So if we can pick it cold, and by usually by harvest, or night times are in the 50s, we can, you know, pick it cold, it arrives at the winery goal. It's if we can do that. So it's, it's all nighttime picking, and I think now we're ready to taste wine. Okay. So what we have here is a good idea of our um, different Rhone varieties, and we'll start off with the Viognier, which is from Flavia, and um, again when we started, the um, idea was to. You know, that half acre of Viognier was strictly, I thought there is no way we're going to have a white wine I'd want to drink in this warm climate. So I just kind of dismissed it. And then they made this beautiful Viognier. And I thought, okay, that's a fluke. And then the second year it frosted. So we didn't learn anything there. But by 2009, when we planted more, both Helen and the Fabias convinced me we want Viognier from the place. So here's, here's our Viognier. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt, but I forgot to do some the one thing Alex oh, thank asked you. me to do. So <laughs> I would tell you that um, the wine in the middle is going to be compared to the fourth wine. So uh, that the we'll, we'll taste those at the same time. And then we're going to taste the last wine, the sixth wine before, well, the last wine here before the fifth. The, the sixth before the I'll lead you through it. But don't but stop. <laughs> Don't, don't move anything. Just if I go. So just, yeah. yeah, don't go ahead and taste. Don't ruin the So the Viognier, what we've learned in the vineyard, and again, I feel like, as I said, this is a one year 11 vintage. We're still learning. It's, it's um, such a um, adventure. And thank goodness I've got these great winemakers helping me on this adventure, but we keep learning. Um, the one year that the Viognier frosted, it wasn't a terrible, you know, there's some shoots made it and some didn't, and so it was really um, ununiform. And so we did some um, green cluster thinnings, but there was still a lot of variability, and it made a really beautiful wine. So now our normal leafing is to make sure some stays pretty shaded and gets that really nice citrus while others get quite a bit of sunlight and you get more of that um, uh, honey and fig. And um, I mean, I think if Helen and Angela, if you want to blast in at any point, please do. <laughs> but um, so we, we try to do this kind of yin yang with the trellising to not just expose everything, but to make sure some fruit gets this really beautiful golden color and others are these really pretty green clusters. Um, uh, yeah, so we'll leave this slide up a bit so you can get the details, but as far as the vineyard, um, it's, it's a pretty, pretty low vigor VMA. On the, the sites it is, we have three different lots now, and um, this wine is from all three. Okay, the second line is going to be the Grenache from Angela. And so, um, she mentioned the quartz yesterday, so I had to put in a picture of the quartz. <laughs> um, and you can go to the next slide, it just has its details. So, yesterday you tried the 2013, so this is the 2012, so you with good memories can uh, compare. Um, exact same rows. Each of the winemakers at Shake Ridge have their rows. Those are their rows. They keep those rows. <laughs> I won't take them away. As long as they're making good wine, they get their rows. <laughs> so, um, and so whatever's happening in the rows, we'll fine tune it for what they're looking for. Um, so when you taste these wines uh, from year to year, they are the same, pretty much the same, same rows. Um, 
So this Grenache is on, it's this 362 on um, 33 Lamont Woodstock. It's on uh, not as steep as the S1 side of the block that um, Helen gets. It's um, a nicer soil, being that it's in a, in a saddle, so that's why I used the 3309 for it. Um, Grenache, in general, at Shake Ridge, I mean, even more, of all the varieties, I'm more worried about having direct sunlight on the fruit. And so even where we have it on a trellis, instead of tucking shoots, we pull shoots out. So I'm trying to make the trellis actually look like a head train vine only a long row of them. So we'll, we'll pull shoots out. We'll um, um, try to get it as broad as we can and then spend a lot of work inside opening up the canopy from the inside so it's really nice filtered light. And then it takes multiple passes for crop thinning. We'll often get, um, you know how the bottom of the clusters tend to be really big and you've got these beautiful loose clusters. So we'll cut the bottom half of the cluster off instead of cutting just wings off. Um, again, this is a block I really play with that boron because we will do um, boron in with our sprays because we're such low boron. But the Zen and the Grenache, I'm, I'm, I'm just pleading for just a little shadow, please, <laughs> for to get looser clusters. It's a fine line, but um, uh, and then we'll just thin the, the, the Grenache usually gets thin about you know first by shoot length and then by sh uh, cluster size and then that last color. And then we're usually back in one more time to just um, try to make sure it's the right amount of fruit to get to harvest. You guys can ask questions too. <laughs> um, I haven't gotten to taste these all together ever. It's so much fun. So. <laughs> I can't answer that last one. I like them all for different reasons. It's like, which wine is your favorite? It's our, don't you say the one in your glass? Or as my father would say, which child is your favorite? And so the one that's closest to me, because they might, you know. Um, but I do, we have 24 winemakers right now that buy fruit. And so um, it's, um, some just get a ton, two tons. Um, and even those can be multiple picks. Uh, I think um, last year on the 46 acres, we picked maybe 150 tons. It's a big year. I think we had 160 lots of wine that left, or grapes that left the vineyard. It's a lot of small lots. And um, we'll pick the top of the block. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit with uh, Don Pierre Pervesa and, and Helen's Petit. Yes. Contracts, except for one, are by tons, but for those rows. So the question was contracts by acreage versus ton. Um, I, I, they trust me, I trust them. Um, as far as there's, there's usually not a lot of, I, I beat myself up more, I think, than the winemakers do when there's too much fruit. Um, they know I'm going to try to do the best, and it just seems like most of them are small. And um, almost all of them are really small, and they're trying to make a living. It's it's working while we're doing it, how we're doing it. Yes? Was your timing on snipping the bottoms of the trees? It depends every year. I mean, it's just, it's how the vines grew. So we'll do that first where it's clusters off of wheat shoots. And then it's then we, at seed hardening, we'll do um, cluster weights and get an idea where they're going by harvest. And like, are they really as big as they look? Or they're not that big, you know. And then it's usually the, the bottom parts come off, <laughs> um, as well as wings. So whatever we need to do to get those cluster sizes down at um, between seed hardening and moration, unless it's a really was a really wet year, because we've got you know a good six feet of soil. So in a regular rainfall year of 40 inches, we're fighting bigger, and I need to leave that fruit on, and maybe maybe it's. I, I like to try to have the main fruit thinning done well before veraging because I think the sooner I can do it, as soon as the vine has slowed its growth, almost stopped its growth, then that's when we do the biggest takeoff fruit, which can change every year. So it, it, it's odd because you talk about the bigger, and I haven't experienced this because perhaps we have the water and you know, we were lucky in 18 inches, but I've just heard the bigger. Have you ever seen very swell? 
That's why I wait. I wait till the mines. I, I have to wait till the mines are done. Because and that's that's why I'll do it in multiple passes too. And it's also with the Zinfandel. You know, so if you if you just come in and say, oh, okay, I want two ton an acre. Did yeah, but when you have to have huh? Did you learn that by mistake one year Oh yeah. Oh yeah, many years. Like, I used to do Pinot Noir. Okay. Yeah. And if you do thinny too early, when I was at Chandon we had a great uh, research department that we could do. So any does any experiment I could design, we could do it. But the deal was you had to do it three years in a row. Which was good before we incorporated. And so um, yeah, so it's just over time it's just and reading and trying to read the plants, and we will thin the tops of blocks before we do the bottom of the block. Because often on those kind of hills, there's a lot happening from top to bottom, and so the bottom is more vigorous usually, and we'll need to keep that extra crop on longer. But then we'll still come in as soon as it's slowed down and take care of it. So, okay, the third mine is our Mavedra, and so when um, Hardy Wallace from Dirty and Rowdy came up and said, I want to do 100% Mavedra. Low alcohol, high acid. And I said, you're kidding. <laughs> but he is, I don't know how many of you know him, but such a charming guy. He can talk you into stuff. And he's made me a, a convert. So, um, and I just thought it, it's just, these first three are all 100%. So actually the first four are all 100%. So it's good for you to get to see the, the bridal on their own. Um, sometimes I, I, I tease Hardy that I'm going to lock the gate and not let him in until there's at least a little color <laughs> in the wine. And so we're, we, we joke, but, but sometimes I think, okay, I, I normally do not argue with any of the winemakers when they want to harvest because that's such a personal decision what they want to do with the fruit. But um, um, this, is, this is one that we have had discussions on. And we come to compromises. <laughs> so the clone we have is the on top 369. At the time, there was really just that was what was available. I like it. It's on um, the new blocks are quite different. Um, soils, terrain. Again, um, the vineyard. When we designed the vineyard, the whole idea was. I wanted people, I wanted us to make our own estate wines, I wanted people who bought fruit from us to make shape fruit wines. And so I, I tried to introduce as much complexity in the choices of the clones, the different, where different blocks were placed, um, the, the different root stocks, anything we could do to just have complexity from lot to lot, so you put those lots together and have an interesting one. So uh, Hardy gets two, the same clones, but two different rootstocks on two really different soil types. So they both are southwest, pretty steep slopes that um, get that good afternoon light. Because of so many other things, is it just the clone? Do you feel like it's just the clone? Because I think the rootstock has a lot in S1 and S2. Uh, they're bigger. The 515 seems to be bigger, cluster, smaller berries. Would you say? Yeah. And um, the 362, I think you'd agree with this. Is, 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 is there's an aromatics that's quite different from the other. And, and very pretty, where the other ones are kind of darker and serious, more serious. Would you call it your cowgirl? Yeah. yeah. So uh, Angela's term for a 362 is her cowgirl. It's kind of very feminine, but kind of out there. <laughs> um, 
I, I'm just not real sure about cluster morphology, cone to cone, and I think a lot of it, the soil's so different. I mean, the differences I see, I can't really say if it's the cone as much as St. George versus 33 or 9 for starters. Big difference there. That's going to affect your cluster morphology. Okay, the, the fourth wine is our house, it's a house wine. So Yorba is um, the label that we have for the vineyard. I didn't want to use Shake Ridge vineyards or anything for our wine. So we stuck with the, my dad was a third generation Yorba orange grower down in Yorba Linda. It's an old family name, um, and that was his grandparents. And so we thought, okay, it was the brand for the oranges for three generations, so let's just keep going with it. So these are our Yorba Syrahs. And I wanted to bring the 2012 because that's what everybody else had. It was born, yes? It is. <laughs> Not me, but my great great grandfather. Yeah. Is that in Southern California? Yeah, that's in your in Placentia. Yeah. Um, yeah, they've been around a long time. Okay, so here's a good point. So people talk about, oh, a land grant. You got a land grant. Well, I didn't get a land grant, number one. That was eight generations ago. And they gave the soldiers land grants so they would stay. They weren't about to ship them back to Spain, mind you. So they had to stay here, and they wanted them to settle and propagate. Okay, the Yorba family did a really good job with the propagating part of it. So Jose Antonio Yorba was a soldier. His son, Bernardo, who's in my line, had 21 kids, took them three different wives to do so. Yeah, I mean, right? You had to, you had, you need labor for the ranch, okay? Okay, so he had 21 kids, and his will is so interesting because they, they enumerated what each kid got from the ranch, okay? One guy got three cows, which were worth more than 10,000 acres of Southern California, Orange wow. County. So at that time, if you did not, okay, if you don't have water, this is what your land's worth. So three cows, I'm sure there were oxen, but three oxen were worth more than 10,000. Anyway, long story short, there is no land grant left anymore. <laughs> not to, but by our generation. But it's a real fun family history and um, been, been around a long time. So yes, Kramer and Norman is all part of it. Um, so the two Syrahs we have here, exact same rows in the vineyard. Um, we've got, uh, again, I tried to give the Syrah the coolest spots in the house. We decided to stick with 100% Syrah, because again, I wanted to make our Syrah so we could show people what the Syrah was. I decided not to do the co ferment with the um, Viognier. Three different clones, and um, Ken, Ken Bernard from Ancien is our winemaker for Yorba. Um, I do his vineyard work. He's my one consultant, or consulting gig that I still have. Because he makes a wine, and I'm not about to quit him because I don't want him to quit me. So um, he and I have worked in Chile on, the, on a project together, and I've been working on a project together using a lot of these same clones. And we see the same distinction between the clones. I find for our clones, the on top clones, very singular notes in a way, but you layer them together, you make these really beautiful wines. Um, so the 174 is our um, aromatic component. And the 470 is structured, so it's really dark fruit with some pretty wild spices of its own. And then the Noir is from Phelps, um, Joseph Phelps. And there's so many stories about where that selection came from. I'm not even going to go there. But it's a, it's a beautiful wine. And of all the um, blocks on the vineyard, it's the one you could use as a pure a Miss Tamil Syrah. Um, but it's really flower floral and um, it's got this gorgeous structure to it. So those are the three, but the, you have the nine, which is our current release, and the 12, which is probably three years from now, will be our release. But I thought it would be fun for you to taste them side by side. And the exact same, you know, the vintages were about a week apart. The 2009 was picked in September 15th versus the 22nd. Um, but kind of pretty similar to some years. I think mine had some more heat spikes than 12 did. But um, it's just also, I thought, you can see how they age, too. Okay, so now is when we're going to make you 
work because you got it. I want you to taste number six now instead of number five. I don't know what I was thinking. Oh, yeah, we, well, we, yeah, so that was the specs on my mind. It's, it's pretty much exactly the same other than the harvesting. Um, we do do 30% on our, on our straws, we do 30% whole cluster. I pick the different, um, uh, a can has a very small winery, very limited, and so what I can do on the vineyard side is when we harvest, we, we have the different straw blocks separate for the first couple of years and realize we can't pick them together. The noir gets pushed a little bit to come in with the other ones. And the 174 is a little on the high, high majority side. Um, but what we do is, I, by that time, I've picked for other people. I know pretty much how much fruit is in each of our rows. And I deliver fruit to Ken so he can take a bin of each. They're partially filled depending on how much there is. And he can put them together and have one fermenter for them. Because everything we do is in the one ton fermenters. So it's, it's a little crazed night. But we do it, and he makes him happy, and he makes her So, so we do co-ferment them from the get-go. So they go in at picked together, co-fermented, and we feel like it makes them much better. Okay. I have a question really quick. Are most of your harvest dates, I mean, I know all the years are different, but it looks like September. Well, yeah, except for last year, and I have a feeling this year we got started in August. But normally, up until last year, we would just do, like, the VOMA would come in the second week of September, and the third week of September we'd get going, and by the last September, first October, things are rolling fast, and then the Petite Syrah would be that last week of October, even, and the Medvedra sometimes, too, even into November. Uh, last week started about two weeks early, and by the first week of by the middle of September, we were more than halfway through when we normally would have started. So, and this year, way too early to say, but it looks like we're on track for the same. Okay, so the number six wine is Fabia's Rompe Cabeza. So this is their GSM of the vineyard. And um, I've got a slide with showing all the different blocks that go into this wine. It depends on um, which Syrah is dependent on what they can pull from at that time. And we do the same for Helen's Lipic, is that usually the Viognier comes in with the first of the Syrahs, and then that later Syrahs come in with the top of the Grenache shell, and then the bottom of the Grenache shell comes in with the top of the Mavedra. So they can at least do some co ferments of the different varieties together, and then put their final blend together at the end. And so um, it's, it's, it's a fun, fun wine. And so it is pretty much, this is a third, third, third this year. And, and their Rompia Cabeza tends to be, that's what they were looking for. They wanted a third of each. Each year it's a little different. And some years it gets um, the only. Um, yeah, so you have the separate picking days depending on what was happening. Um, oh, this is 5 by 8 as well. I love the question marks in there. They call it Rompia Cabeza because the first year when they were tasting it, it was so aromatic because of the Grenache that they felt like it almost seemed like a white wine if you were in a, if you didn't see what you were tasting and, and it was just kind of mind-boggling, and so rompia cabeza in Spanish is broken head, which is the term for a puzzle. So this is their puzzle piece. So that's, that's where it came up with its name. Okay, and then the last line is Helen's Sumo. And talking about names, I love that name. And Helen, can you project enough to tell people? It's just such a great name. It's a big beast, but light on its feet. So we named it Sumo because um, sumo wrestlers are obviously massive, and so is Petite Sarah. But Sumo is an art form, and when you watch that, those guys have some serious moves. And so the way that um, 
opening the pizza straw and just give it a little bit of a lift, a little high note, and then a little bit of straw just to smooth it out and give it a little more bandwidth so it's a little more comfortable. It's that's the it's the sort of the right thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that, yeah, you can do it, so let's do it. But it's, there's still some of the wild, wild west going on. Um, Skinner in um, El Dorado is doing a great job. Uh, Grayson Hartley is now there in the back row if you want to talk to him about El Dorado County. He's working at Dave Girard and, and making big improvements there. So it's, um, and then you've got some old timers that have been making beautiful wine for a long time and just don't get the attention. So. Yeah, I have a question about uh, somewhere. Most of the wine look like they have a high pH and low acidity, but at the same time, when I taste your wine and I see the number of uh, the tier, and the pH is uh, pH lower, higher acidity, coming from the same terroir kind of, and LN wine also is going to be higher in, uh, even in the test. So do you think it's a uh, characteristic of the place, so it's more uh, winemaking, winemaker decision about the, the timing of the harvest. I, so the question is about just pH and TA changing among the different winemakers? And but you have, I would say, the three and the last wine, three first and last wine, mm -hmm. all kind of a very uh, low TA, but at the same time your wine as a, as a, as high. a higher one. So, let me think that it's more uh, winemaker decision. I think decision. it's definitely winemaker decision. There's a lot of winemaker decision going on here. Yeah. Oh, right now. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, Ready for lunch? I was wondering uh, your thoughts on tilling. Do you do it? And if so, when? Oh, tilling is, I am such a proponent of not tilling. But I do have some blocks that are still two weeks. So it, the first year after planting, Every other row went into a permanent cover crop and is still there. And then as the vines got older, like the Syrah were the first to go into permanent cover crop to just deal with that early spring vigor. Um, the Petite Syrahs being on better soil also went into, um, and some of those probably shouldn't have been. <laughs> um, but if, especially in the hills and now with a lack of rain, when it does rain and you have a permanent cover, I really do think you get much better penetration and much of that water stays there. Um, we're really careful when we mow to try to encourage the low growing, um, the clovers that we planted, and try not to have a lot of big water using plants as part of our cover crop. Um, where we do do alternate rows, so every other row gets spaded every year, those are the rows that we will do a, a soil building cover crop in the fall. And, and it, I, I've only got probably out of the 46 acres, there's probably maybe eight acres that are still every other row. And eventually I'd like to get them all into permanent. I, I think for our soil, for our location, permanent cover crop, um, better rain penetration, um, they dry out and then they're not using water and it's a good cover of compaction. Uh, it's everything's good except the competition. So 